Hi, I'm Doris Purchase, and welcome to Beyond the Frame, a podcast created just for you by Propeller Art Gallery, artists empowering artists in Toronto. Together, we'll take a deep dive into the hearts and minds of working visual artists today and their practice. In each episode, you will hear illuminating and intimate explorations of all things art, and you'll hear it in the artist's own voice. We'll talk process, inspiration, challenges, and much more. Everything you've ever wanted to know about art making or about the artists themselves happens right here. So let's sit back and have a listen, shall we? Today we welcome Sharon Corrigan Forrest. Which ism is it? Under which ism would you classify your work? I would have to say Impressionism, Expressionism, and Mixed Media, and Material Arts-Based Processes. If I think about the style of Impressionism, my work has always been about my impressions of nature and the painting techniques that I employ. In particular, the manner in which I apply brush strokes and the selection and layering of colors to reflect the mood, the light and shadows of my subject. Many years ago, I paid tribute to my former home in Northern Ontario by creating a series of encaustic paintings on linen. Many of the pieces were in a narrative format using diptych and triptych formats as large as 6 feet by 12 feet, the perfect scale to tell a story of striking heights of the old growth forest. I feel that expressionism is another ism that I employ since it allows me to convey my emotions. It may be through the techniques that I apply using various brush strokes, depending on the medium and tools, the actual application of the medium itself and the embedding of certain materials that blur the relationship between images and feelings. Maybe in my use of messaging as a response to past experiences and or circumstances that I react to in my immediate world. And then I'm not sure if this fits into an ism. There is mixed media and material-based processes. At times, and depending on my desire to experiment, I may incorporate various materials Again, processes, techniques. It may be the use of photo-based imagery, different types of printmaking, embedding laser die-cut materials such as paper, birch ply, and plexiglass, and or remnants or debris from nature, decaying leaves, moss, birch bark, and branches. My enjoyment and often the creative challenge comes from incorporating the various methods and materials in the assemblage of each piece. In some cases, there may be a considerable amount of time that passes before I revisit their use. And when this happens, it's like saying hello to an old friend that I haven't seen in a while. There is also the reality that when you travel in the world of experimentation with various materials, that some of the work are more successful than others. And the ones that do not get along, I usually leave it alone in order to come back to it at a later date. When doing so, it affords me the opportunity to look at it with fresh eyes and an open mind, thereby providing me, again, with the time element of being able to listen to what it's saying. When this happens, it usually tells me what I need to do next. It is real conversation between my work that I produce and myself as a producer. Who's your muse? Influencers, educators, mentors, who has greatly inspired you? Mm. Okay, Helmut Becker is someone who I met and worked with for a very brief period of time. However, he has had a profound effect on my career as an artist. He is my former professor who introduced me to the world of papermaking and printmaking. Helmut Becker has an extensive career as an artist papermaker, history of exhibitions, research, and publications for which he has gained a notable international reputation. He has taught printmaking, papermaking, hand papermaking, and his research involves fibers of flax and hemp. Helmut was the first person to introduce me to the art of papermaking, and I've loved it ever since. When working under his tutelage, he mainly focused on working with flax and hemp, teaching us, in particular, I would stay longer to work with the materials and be able to create not just 
two-dimensional but three-dimensional pieces from the pulp that we produced. Since then, I've been fascinated with paper and the process. I've been fortunate to have studied with masters in Japan in Tochigi Prefecture and in Boston where I studied with the daughter of Elaine and Sidney Koretsky at Carriage House Paper. Their focus is on the creation of paper that use a range of pulps and fibers, including abaca, flax, hemp, cotton, and kozo. The main pulp that I used to create, again, both two- and three-dimensional paper art was flax and abaca. And this now leads me to speak about one more very important muse, Nancy Jacoby. In the 80s, I remember visiting your store on Queen Street West and becoming enamored with the products. I just wanted to touch everything. Nancy's enthusiasm for washi was and continues to be contagious. And it was because of these visits to the Japanese paper place that I sought out opportunities to study paper making as well as indigo dyeing in Japan. Since then, I've been fortunate to have taken workshops and to have worked with Nancy and her staff when co-curating the Promise of Sekishu exhibition, a collaboration between Propeller Art Gallery and the Japanese Paper Place. Nancy's passion and love of Washi also includes her support of many centers, organizations, galleries, including Propeller Art Gallery, and she is amused to a huge number of artists, including being a founding member of the Washi Sisters. Materials matter. What are your chosen favorite tools and preferred medium? Hmm. Now I feel as though I have to pick out and name my favorite child. Okay, I will do so. And I would have to say that my favorite medium is oil and encaustic. I've been using it in my work since the early 80s, and my affinity for it is because it has a richness, depth, ability to build textures, and a possession of an inner light that to myself no other medium is able to achieve in terms of having these special qualities. I'm able to embed paper, metallic leaf, and other surfaces into it, allowing me to create a medley of impasto-built surfaces. I've used it on linen, canvas, paper, and birch panel. I also greatly enjoy the act of moving it around on whatever surface I'm working on, dripping, dragging, layering, and playing with the heated wax and oil. In so doing, I may use various brushes, palette knives, flexible metal markers, and various stylus devices. Now, as we speak, Ruth Maud, Sharon Dembo, Susan Ruptash and myself are presenting Layers of Meaning, which is an international encaustic exhibition with over 125 works of art submitted by 84 artists from 12 countries that will open as an online exhibition at Propeller Art Gallery on July 7th. I'm honored to be a part of this exciting exhibition. Slump Secrets. What methods do you employ to get yourself out of a slump? When I feel as though I'm in somewhat of a slump, I would have to say that it all has to do with being able to restore my creative energy, since I'm happiest when I'm able to create. It may involve walks in nature, my way of seeing macro and micro plant world around me, gallery visits that feed my soul, travel adventures that open my mind, association with other artists that energize me, and quiet time for reflection. I have also found that over the years that self-discipline is a major part of being creative. And if you develop a routine, the slumps become fewer. It is similar to a conversation where one idea expressed leads to another, to another again, and then the excitement unfolds in the eagerness to begin the process of expressing it. In the beginning, so tell me a bit about your process. Do you have a bag of tricks, lucky talismans, or habits? Where do you start? And more importantly, when do you stop? My process is quite simple. Starting with an idea, I'll begin by weighing the merits of it and then examining its value in terms of its personal meaning and whether or not it has legs or longevity to move it in different directions and or into the format of a series. 
I will then take it to the next step of shaping the idea by deciding on multiple ways to express it and then narrowing my focus. It could be through mixed media painting, paper assemblage, and or other forms of expression that are like conversations with old friends. Calling all emo. What do you wish people to think or feel when they contemplate your work? If the works are successful, I want it to be art that doesn't simply become visual candy on the wall. I would like people to be able to see it differently over a period of time. It may be its appearance at various times of the day, depending on natural or artificial light, or it may depend on the seasonal changes of the light itself that alters the appearance of the work and captures a visual reaction from people when they pass it by. It may also be that someone might see the work differently depending on their mood, emotions, experiences, or simply the pleasure that it may offer to the viewer. The struggle is real. Talk to me about your biggest challenges as an artist. What methods do you use to overcome these challenges? Sometimes it's the nature of creativity being a solo act unto itself. There's an aloneness that can be the best way of allowing your thoughts and expressions to emerge. However, it could also lead to a feeling of isolation. At times, its effects have led to a narrowing of my perspective on my work due to the lack of external stimuli. So over the years, I've learned to associate with other creative individuals, and it could be through an artist collective, workshops, and conferences, that frequently have the power to restore my sense of creative well-being. Picture perfect. In your opinion, what constitutes a perfect piece of art? And what qualities in your own work would you signify as a perfect work? For example, perfect composition, confident brushstrokes, illustrating a concept, or something else altogether? Simple. When looking at a perfect piece of art, It makes me stop and think. I want to know more about the artist, the artwork, the message, the technical skills, materials, and to understand the reasons for this piece having an impact on me. That, for me, is perfection. As far as my own work, I don't believe that I've ever achieved perfection. And if I feel that if at any time in the future I do so on a personal basis, I would find it to be very disturbing. Now, that being said, there are works of art that I've created that I quite simply would not change. They continue to give me visual pleasure and are representative of certain special memories and or experiences. It could be in the subject matter, the color that I've employed, the mixing of materials, the technique, or that it is a visual conversation that came to a lovely conclusion. Though at the end of the day, I think that no one really knows what a perfect work of art is. Art speak. How do you feel about titling, discussing, and explaining your work? I have real challenges when titling my work and often feel that I'm forced to do so. Presently, I've come to a place where I title a series as opposed to individual works within this series. I've always wanted the work to stand on its own and not be framed by giving it a title that I feel is somewhat contrived. Please forgive me if that sounds somewhat arrogant, since I often find it entertaining when reading the titles of artwork displayed in galleries and museums. Now, when it comes to the discussion or explanation of my work, there's a certain irony involved in my attempt to address this question. For years, as an educator, I incorporated into each course a final component that included individual student presentations and the meaning and processes behind the creation of the work that they're presenting. It was all about them and their work, since I was quite simply the quiet guide on the side. That being said, I forgot about my own development, and in the years following, I've had the opportunity to discuss my work on many occasions. Similar to my students, I need to organize my thoughts, use reference notes, and try to engage my audience, anticipate questions, and to remember to thank the people for taking their time to learn more about me and the work that I produce. Heavy metal or classical, what do you listen to while you work? Or is silence your thing? 
I do love listening to music while making art. My taste and my tunes are definitely eclectic. Jazz, world, blues, classical, folk, Motown, Celtic, and many, many more genres. What a wonderful way to create a sensory experience, ambiance, or mood as background setting while working in my studio. Why for art, though? Why do you make art? Oh, dear. The final question and my answer is, why do I breathe? My earliest memories of making art is taking my older sister's pencil and doodling characters from my storybooks in her line notebook. She had to explain that when she went to school. I would use any surface, brown butcher paper, and including my mom's stationery. Most of the time, the compulsion to make marks kept me out of trouble. Trust me, it still does today. Seriously, the act of making art has always been about visual expression based upon my inner and outer world. My thoughts, feelings, emotions, people I know and or meet for the first time, experiences that have left an indelible mark. Specific times in my life, objects that are meaningful, and without a doubt, the satisfaction of being able to visually express myself and communicate with others. I would like to now take this opportunity to thank the Beyond the Frame team. Tracy Thompson, Bill Nguyen, Spencer Sunshine, Anthony Yordanov, Vlad Nikola, Doris Purchase, and the Orange Lounge Toronto Recording Studio, and also the support from Parnair and Lisa Johnson. Thanks, guys. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Beyond the Frame, a PAG podcast. To hear more episodes and to view the artist's works, please visit www.propellerartgallery.ca. Hosted by Doris Purchase, produced by Tracy Thompson, and recorded at the Orange Lounge Studio in Toronto. Also, the Propeller Art Gallery recognizes the presence of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Huron-Wendat Nations. We acknowledge we are hosted on land governed by Treaty 13, the Toronto Purchase, the Two-Row Wampum Treaty, and the Dish with One Spoon Treaty. We are committed to peaceably sharing and caring for the resources around the Great Lakes and operating the gallery on the principles of inclusiveness as we continue to exhibit art created by artists from all over the world. Thank you for listening.